Hey there, Reconciled Church. Pastor Kevin here, back with another in our video series. That's a great question. Basically, I said, hey, you can ask me a question, any kind of Bible question you have, and I'll do some research. I'll look it up. I'll consider uh, what I what I hold to on this, and I'll let you know what I think on it. Um, last week, we looked at the idea of prophets. This week, we have another hot button topic. We're looking at the question of predestination and free will, Main, namely how those two things work together. Now, if you're unfamiliar with this discussion, hey, welcome to church. This is like the favorite uh, topic of debate for every Sunday school class that's ever existed. So let me give it to you straight. Basically, if God has predestined all that comes to pass, how then can there be free will? Or to put it another way, you can flip it around. If there's free will, how could God ordain all that comes to pass? Now, this is a big point of contention in the church. Uh, I don't pretend to uh, to um, walk the line on this stuff, but I want to give it to you straight. Uh, and in all things, we submit to the word of Scripture, and we want to understand these things in terms of Scripture. So what that means is what I really want to look at today is simply the words themselves and their use in the Bible. So... How do we understand predestination according to Scripture? How do we understand free will according to Scripture? And hopefully that'll give us uh, some idea in order to ask the question of how these things interact. So let's start with predestination. The, the, the verb predestine uh, occurs in three different spots in Scripture. And I'm going to go over each of these with you guys and kind of unpack what we learn about predestining from that. So uh, in Acts chapter 4, uh, basically, you have a scenario where um, Peter and John were arrested for speaking about Jesus, uh, and then they were released. And then we hear this about them in Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 24. And when they heard, that is, the people heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? This is a reference to Psalm 2. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Okay, so this is the first time we hear that word use. What is it that God is said to predestine here? Well, Herod, Pilate, basically all the people who stood against Jesus. Now, this was a th reason to rejoice. This was a reason to take comfort for the early church. Why? Well, because if God was predestining even those evil men that came to pass to pull off the most evil thing that has ever happened, the murder of God's own son, then it's good news because it means nothing is out of his control, okay? So basically, if those things which led to the cross uh, were, were predestined, that means God had predestined everything, and that gave them comfort. Even when they faced opposition, they could know, this is God's will for, the, for me in this situation. Now, it's one thing to say, that God predestined the resurrection. So when if people kill Jesus, I'll bring him back. It's a whole nother thing to say that God actually predestined the cross itself because the cross came about by the will of evil men. Okay? Next reference, Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 28, we read this. This is Paul speaking. He says, And we know that the, for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, there's that word, to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, there it is again. He also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. Okay, so, once again, this is something used to comfort the church. He's explaining to them, everything works together for the good of those who love God, right? 
Now, also notice here that there's a parallelism. Uh, those who love God are the same as those who are called according to his purpose. So the called are also the ones who love God. That's important just to note. Now, we also see that predestination is in accordance with God's foreknowledge, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, basically, that the result and the result of this is salvation. So if we might ask the question, what does predestination in this case do? Well, it leads to salvation, to being conformed to the image of his son, as Paul puts it here. Um, also, in verse 30, we have this kind of the golden chain of salvation. He, those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. So we can't separate those who've been predestined from those who are glorified and justified, right? So clearly, predestination in this uh, passage is referring to salvation. Now, clearly he saved those he predestined. Um, some have then said, looked at the idea of foreknowledge and said, well, look, God's uh, predestining here is based on his foreknowledge. And so what they say is, well, he just knew what was going to happen. He knew those who were going to come to faith in Jesus, and those are those who, the ones he's predestined. Now, there's a couple logical problems I see with this, to be honest with you guys. Uh, first and foremost, it doesn't really make sense with the, the context of the verse. Uh, the purpose is to give comfort that God is actively involved, uh, involved in the believer's life. In this sense, if we were to say that God simply predestined those he knew were going to trust in him, then he is a passive, it's a passive act. And specifically, it's almost unnecessary. So if God simply predestined those who are going to believe in him anyway, what would it matter if he predestined them or not? It's basically, you know, it's literally like someone uh, who watched an episode of Jeopardy and uh, then gave all the answers on the rerun, and everyone's like, "Oh my gosh, how did he? How did he know all these answers?" Well, because he watched the episode beforehand. But that's not the way Bi the Bible portrays predestination. Uh, the Bible portrays it as an active work of God. Um, also, it's worth noting here that it's not saying God foresaw, meaning he just saw for, he foresaw events. He foreknew. What do you, you foreknow people. It's personal, okay? The idea there is that God knew you even before you knew him. Um, and so when we see this, what we see is that God is not um, passive in the act of salvation. He's actively involved in it. Um, uh, and if you think about this, like I said, if you turn this around and said it was based on this idea that he just simply knows the future, and so he basically calls the shots that he knows are going to happen anyway, what we have there is a problem because what we have is God is God's predestination is now actually dependent upon the flow of history. The idea of the Bible is that God's predestination determines the flow of history, okay? If we flipped it around, what would happen is it's actually history, the flow of events in time, that's that's determining God's will, God's predestiny, um, which is not the case. All right, third reference we find to the word predestined in Scripture comes from Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, let me give you uh, the long section uh, in its entirety just to kind of give you context, and I love context. So, chapter 1, starting in verse 3, the Apostle Paul again writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in, every, with, in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Verse 11. 
In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of the inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Okay, let's unpack this section real quick. First, we see that we have another parallel here. Basically, when Paul speaks of his predestination in verse 5 as being chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world in verse 4. So, what is predestination? Predestination, in this sense, is being chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless. Also, notice that what drives God's predestining here is, is specifically the purpose of his will in verse 5, which he says is his intention is in love. So those are the two ways we understand. How has God predestined us in this sense? Well, he's predestined us in, in love, and he's a predestined us according to the purpose of his will. Uh, this passage more so uh, kind of shoots down the idea that God's predestining is, in, is a passive thing. No, no, it's an active thing. It's about it's based on his will and his purposes. Okay. Further, uh, proof of this is seen also in verse eleven, where Paul says that we have been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So it's not just that he predestines salvation; he works all things according to his will. Notice the phrase, him who works. Once again, God is active in this sense. We should understand that. Now, before we move on to the question of free will, which this works out well because it raises the idea of uh, God's will. Uh, it raises the question of divine will. So it transitions kind of nicely. Um, before we move on to the question of human free will, let's pause and recognize something. That these things are explicitly taught in scripture. Wherever you fall on this subject, you have to make sense of these passages. You cannot, so sometimes you talk to people about passages, you bring up a passage with them and they go, well, what about when it says this over here, yada, 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 yada. Well, that's fine. We can address that. But what we can't do is address that and then ignore what's been said over here. We have to take, we have to understand the whole of scripture. So no matter what we are then going to define as the will of man and how we understand the will to be free, we have to understand that these things are in the Bible. You cannot ignore them. You cannot shrug them off, okay? If I have rightly explained these things, and I believe I have in explaining these, it has to be considered in describing everything else. And the reason I specifically began with the predestination question is because if we go into the discussion uh, with the free will thing, which I'm about to jump into, we tend to sometimes just go stop from under from actually dealing with those passages passages at times because what we really are doing is, well, I know it's got to be this one thing, so it can't mean this. Well, this is what I think those passages mean. Now, let's talk about free will and what that means. The word free will occurs 23 times in the Bible. Each reference to the word free will is found in the Old Testament, and each use of the term is connected to the idea of free will offerings. Now, what's a free will offering? What does that mean? Um, also, weren't all offerings free will offerings? Well, in one sense, yes, but different. A free will offering was one that wasn't explicitly commanded in the law. So, for example, things like the tithe or, you know, guilt offerings, things like that. Those were things that were commanded that you do specifically. Free will offerings were things that you wanted to give as well or offer as well that were not explicitly commanded of you in scripture. So, for example, Take the idea of tithe. It was a temple tax. Uh, you could, you, you had to give ten percent. You couldn't give five percent. Okay. Uh, however, you could give beyond that. You could give twelve percent, twenty percent, whatever. That what went beyond what was commanded was a free will offering. 
in that it was up to you. You had freedom in order to decide how much and how to give. The word free will does not, however, occur in the New Testament. Um, however, I do not mean I don't mean by saying that that there is no such concept as free will. Um, I'm not saying we should dismiss the phrase either. Rather, we have to understand what we mean when we say free will according to the Bible. It could be either we want to have a definition of free will that is consistent with the scripture, not antithetical to it, okay? So let's talk about that. What do we mean by free will? Well, there's two ways I can see us talking about the will of man being free. The first of which is this way. We could be saying it as a way of saying that our decisions are made completely on our own without any in outside interference or influence. We also could say it as a way of saying that our decisions were not coerced. Uh, we were not under duress, so to speak, and therefore we are responsible for the ramifications of those decisions. Now, the first of those, I just don't think is true, not only when we talk about God, but when we talk about life as a whole anyways. So, every decision you make has been, to some extent, affected by, influenced by, outside forces, whether it be the company you keep, your history, your background, uh, your preferences, um, your environment, all those things. So if you grew up in a uh, chance, you know, if you grew up in a certain part of the world or a certain part of the country, you might like certain foods because they were simply served to you more. You might have a higher tolerancy and therefore preference for like spicy food if you grew up in a place where spicy food was more common. Uh, if you had friends who uh, liked certain things, like yeah, no one makes decisions inside of a vacuum is what I'm saying. And so not only is this concept not true when we're talking about God, it's not true when we're talking about anything of life. I, I think it should be rejected. But now let's talk about the latter definition. Uh, on this we might agree. And I think we should agree. See, the Bible clearly holds us morally responsible for the decisions we make. You are guilty of your sins regardless of the outside factors involved in it. Let me give you some examples. A kid who goes to the store and steals something is still guilty of theft even if he's giving in to peer pressure. All right? Uh, let me give you another example. A cheating spouse is still guilty of adultery even if another person was uh, flirting with them. They can't use that as an excuse. Oh, well, there was outside influences leading me to make this decision. The Bible holds you accountable for your decision, so you can't simply use that as an excuse. In that sense, we can say that the will of man is free in that we are responsible for the choices that we make. Okay? Now you might say, hold on a minute, Kev. If God determines all that comes to pass, then how can we be held responsible for the decision that we make? Funny thing, the Bible actually addresses this question. As a matter of fact, it's Paul who addresses it in the next chapter of Romans, Romans chapter 9. Let me read it for you. Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it does not depend on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. couple things to notice here. He's not saying that there is no such thing as human will. He's just saying that the outcomes are not dependent upon human will, but on God. Verse 17, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in the earth. So then he has mercy on whom he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. Verse 19, you will then say to me, why does he still find fault? For who cannot resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will that which is molded say to the molder, why have you made me like this? Okay, Paul knows that the objection is what God's, if God, what God wills comes to pass, how on earth could we, he find fault in us? Because after all, who could resist God's will? What Paul doesn't do, guys, and I want to point this out, what he doesn't do is go into a lengthy description of how it all works out here. 
He does not give us all the details to this stuff, possibly because he doesn't even un he doesn't even know how it all works out. He simply knows that these things are so. And the fact of the matter is, neither do you and I. And so, in all these things, I d I don't try I don't want to. I think we do ourselves a disservice by assuming things, assuming more than the Bible gives us teaching to assume. Okay. This is something we have to come to terms with. Just because God doesn't give you all the details doesn't mean it isn't so. And it doesn't mean that he's obligated to explain every detail for how things work. For one reason, we're finite creatures. We probably wouldn't even understand all of it anyway if he explained it to us. For example, in Genesis, God says we read that God created man and woman in his own image. Now, he's not ob obligated to describe how your nervous system works there in the context of Genesis. He doesn't have to work uh, explain how every part of your body works simply to say that he has created you. In other words, it's so because God says it is so. Big thing to remember here, guys. Just because God doesn't explain how, it doesn't mean it isn't so. I don't understand lots of things, okay? Like, I don't understand how my car works. I, I put gas in it, and it goes. And it takes me from here to there. I understand this is not, like, an impossible thing to understand. Just like I said, I'm stupid in some things, people. Anyways, I don't understand how all that stuff works. That doesn't mean my car doesn't exist, okay? The existence of something is not dependent on our knowledge of that thing. Paul then goes on to say... In verse 21, he says, Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, and has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order that he might make known the riches of his glory for the vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory? even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. So what's interesting here is that Paul doesn't answer the question, how? He rather answers the question, why? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for the vessels of his mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory? Something we have to accept is that we may not know all the details, but God does. He's got it figured out, and he's got it, and he's in control. God's both determined all that comes to pass, and he holds us responsible for our decisions. How does that work? I don't know, but I don't know how our will works for that matter. Like, it, it, it's not for me to know all the details that God hasn't, it's not for us to know all the details that God hasn't filled us in on. It's for us to accept what God has described to us, what God has revealed to us. All this suggests, guys, that life is more complex and humanity and our wills and the divine will are all just more complex, more complicated than we might understand them to be. Well, that's what I have for you guys this week on this subject. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed I I hope it's been helpful. Um, I hope it inspires you to read more uh, in the Bible. I hope it answers some questions. You got follow-up questions, let me know. Love you guys. This was a great question. I'll be back next week with another one. God bless.